All right, good morning, everybody. We're joined by a special guest today, John Robb. If you don't know John Robb, you need to know who he is. He is probably the most unconventional thinker I know. He has a, a book he wrote in 2008, I believe it was, John, Brave New War, which you really should read. It really sheds a lot of light on everything that's happening today. He publishes a newsletter also called Global Gorillas. You can find him on Substack, johnrobb.substack.com. I'll have a link in the description below. Sign up for it. You will not regret it, I guarantee it. So John, you, we want to talk to you today because of war. You know, you right. are an expert in war and uh, what well, unconventional war, guerrilla war, um, network war, whatever it is we call it, we have right now. Just, to, just to set context for this whole thing, um, most people normally think of warfare in terms of state actors. It's right. what Russia is doing to Ukraine, what NATO is going to do to Russia, that kind of thing. But, and that's true; those actors exist. But there's a whole other side of this that you discuss that you uh you know that your thinking brings into the you know this whole thing can you can you describe what that is who is this other group or who are these other groups that are that are moving the, the table these days i uh, sorry about the dog there in the background no hear him? all right yep no sweat um uh, i was problem with afraid that my dogs would hear and and, and they would all start barking as part of a pack but go ahead right. <laughs> yeah i have two border collies and they're a little high strung um okay let me uh, put it into context that uh, may work here, is that we've seen a change in warfare since the end of the Cold War. And um, it used to be you know, run primarily by states. You know, if you looked at the 20th century, it really was just a, 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 a slog match between different systems for running a nation state. And the uh, top predator won um, and uh, it destroyed all the competition. And um, what happened was that, that peace changed everything. And uh, the post-Cold War environment hollowed out the nation state, diminished its cap capacity for uh, exercising power across the board, uh, everything from loss of control of people flows, loss of control of finances and econ the internal economics by uh, increasing trade, uh, lost control of the messaging, um, and uh, created this kind of complex global environment, which then diminished their ability to actually make decisions. Uh, you know, the decision-making system that we, was great for, well, relatively good for uh, running a nation state separated from everything else is became um, untenable in this kind of new complex environment. Okay, so how did that affect warfare? Well, um, it uh, changed it in a couple ways. There's a couple ways to kind of go, in, go at this. Uh, one is that, uh, we had a nuclear peace that was intact since the end of the Cold War, uh, where big powers didn't fight each other. And um, because of the fear and worry that, you know, it would escalate into nuclear conflict. Um, that diminished the amount of warfare that was uh, seen around the world. And um, we also had increase in trade and the more connected the nation was, the less likely we were to see fighting. Uh, see conventional warfare, um, and the num so that meant the number of countries that that would end up in in, in a large scale conventional war uh, got smaller and smaller. You know, it was like North Korea, Iraq, Iran, um, and the more connected they were, the less likely that that happened. I think the only reason we even invaded Iraq is because they were under sanctions, so they were disconnected in many ways. Um, and the reason we're not invading North Korea is because they have a nuke. So it's like a very, very few countries that we would actually um, uh, see engage in, in large scale conventional warfare. And then there was a, um, another change in that we saw the rise of networks. We saw the rise of, of corporations. Uh, I kind of framed this in a, in a previous report, uh, apex predator theory, is that the apex predators of the 20th century, which are uh, the nation states uh, were being replaced through their weakness by uh, meso predators. Uh, it's kind of the same kind of uh, ecosystem dynamic we see when we take out wolves or the apex predators from an environment and we see the meso predator population expand very, very rapidly because it doesn't have any of the social controls. And they overhunt the prey animals and then the decline of the prey animals causes erosion and you know, ecosystem destruction, um, disease, et cetera, et cetera. And in this case, we see the apex predator being the nation state being weakened and then 
the meso predators are starting to uh, emerge as as contenders. And in this case, it'd be the corporations, these big global network corporations, and and networks. And um, we're seeing the, the effects of how networks engage in online warfare um, in this most recent conflict. Well, let's, um, let's talk about that with, with Russia and Ukraine today. Like, yeah. there's so much more happening than just what Russia is doing to Ukraine and what Ukraine is doing, doing defensively, you know, back to Russia and even the sanctions regime. I mean, there's so much more beyond that. Can you talk about some of those elements? Yeah, um, the re Western response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine was um, very different than what anyone would have suspected could have happened, you know, uh, a day or two into the conflict or before the conflict, we never thought we'd get to the kind of level of escalation and, and this kind of global existential conflict uh, based on this invasion alone. Um, the old Cold War protocols of how nuclear powers you know, deal with each other um, to avoid escalation were all kind of thrown out. Um, and they were uh, overwritten by this network. And uh, I've been talking about and writing about uh, how networks engage in warfare for a long time since I saw it kind of emerge in Iraq and then up through the Arab Spring protests and Rica Renuzia and, and Puerto Rico and uh, most recently in US politics with Trump and, and Occupy and Tea Party and et cetera. And um, you know, I was kind of waiting to see it hit the global stage. And what we saw is something hit the global stage that was uh, very reminiscent of, of those earlier uh, mm -hmm examples. And this network sprang into action uh, within a day or two of, of the invasion. Uh, it initially focused on Ukraine and then focused and then changed its focus to focus on disconnecting Russia and bringing the war to Russia. Um, and then you saw millions of people, uh, both inside and outside of government, government leaders, corporations, individuals um, operating uh, either directly in defense of Ukraine or, or disconnecting Russia. Um, dis you know, Russia up till uh, last month was a, you know, fully integrated Western country. I mean, in the sense that its systems were all integrated with the West and it, they are effectively disconnected, um, you know, except for the, the gas sales to Europe, uh, you know, virtually everything else is, is, has been cut off. Even the, you know, the high speed rail, between you know, Helsinki and St. Right. Petersburg, right? shut it down. Shut it down. So physically, you can't even move. Uh, they uh, Airbnb said, "Okay, we're, you know, we'll shut down Airbnb in Russia, but we're also now banning you know Russian citizens, All Russian clients across the entire world. So if you're a refugee, you can't even you can't even find a place to stay on that system, which is like the biggest hotel system in the world. And um, so the, the disconnection is is has grown ever more intense with every day." Um, and this network has been escalated the conflict that would have been contained within Ukraine to a you know global existential conflict that uh, I don't think we want to be in, and I don't think yeah. the world wants to be in, but we're in it, um, so and, and we're kind of locked you, in. The the network is it's just is a very for some people it might be a very abstract concept though. Can you like how how can you what's something tangible that you can help people understand what it, the network is and how it has its own sort of mind of its own, it's yeah. kind of hive mind almost. Yeah, I mean, it comes out of a um, open source software. So, you know, how a, how a, a bunch of people with uh, different reasons for participating all come together to work on a, on, on a single piece of software and, and they can innovate and make it really, really great. Uh, within the context of warfare or, or protest, uh, what happens is, is like, say for instance, the Ricky Renuncia in Puerto Rico where they could try to get rid of the governor is that uh, they went to go get rid of the governor and they had uh, people from across the political spectrum showing up to make it happen and, and find ways to kind of advance that protest. We saw it in the you know, removal of Mubarak as well in Egypt is that you had people uh, from all these different you know, parts of the political spectrum, religious spectrum, all coming together to do that one thing, that one goal ties together all of these people. Um, and uh, it, you know, you could, you could put two of them in a, in a room together and they probably would, you know, kill each other uh, because of the different motivations, the way they see the world. Uh, but within the respect of this network and, you know, it, within this protest, within this war, they all come together 
and uh, work together to kind of achieve that goal. Um, these networks usually are very, oh, go ahead. I was say, usually these goals are overly simplistic though, aren't they? It's right. like, it's like get rid of Putin, you know, it's a regime change or, you know what I mean? It's something that's something super simplistic usually, isn't it? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the only thing that the whole network can agree on. Hmm. So, so it's the lowest common denominator, that right? Everybody. Okay. <laughs> right. It's the lowest common denominator that everyone can agree on. Um, because they all see the world in different ways. I think it's a kind of a reflection of the way the world works now is that, you know, uh, we all come up with our own ways of, of seeing what's good. You know, we're, we're you know, as a collapse of religion has, has, has occurred, you know, we are all self-determining, you know, what we consider good. Uh, but the only way we come together is what we're against. And, uh, you know all the all the big movements we're seeing online uh, the anti uh, racism anti trump uh, anti uh, colonialism on it you know the anti vax or anti anti vax exactly it's like <laughs> it's all been about defining who you dislike creating a pattern of behavior that you can then identify in in, in any instance and then joining together to defeat it but uh, you ask anybody in any of these movements, what they see as justice or what they see as, you know, the positive future, and they can't agree on anything, zero. Mm. Uh, it's, oh, John, uh, how uh, how is uh, I see or once did see uh, this conflict between Russia and Ukraine is basically a, a border war, the type of thing that's been going on in that part of the world for over a thousand years, but a border war. Uh, with um, uh, borderline adjustments between two shithole countries that really shouldn't affect anybody. And in recent history in Europe, I would have, comp I would have compared it to um, the secession of Kosovo from Serbia, because uh, this was a secessionist movement of Donbass from the Ukraine for uh, reasons that seem to me just as good as those of uh, Kosovo breaking away from Serbia. And of course, then the uh, US comes in and bombs the hell out of Serbia and kills tens of thousands of people. That's fine. Uh, but uh, the Russians try to uh, protect the uh, Donbass people and that's not fine. So is there some, some bigger thing going on here? Or is it just that the US controls the world media, not the Russians? Yeah. Um... Yeah, you, you could see it as kind of a Slavic civil war, uh, and it's a, you know ongoing conflict between two relatively corrupt countries, and and you know there's they've been hashing things out for a while. Um, it should have been just a, a sub-regional war uh, handled by nation states. You know we could have sent arms into the Ukraine to make it more expensive for Russia, um, which they seem to be more than capable of actually defending themselves. In a normal circumstance, that probably would have been the the best strategy: keep it low, keep Russia connected but help Ukraine defend itself. Well, it does sound like that's the way it started out. Oh yeah, it did within days. But the, see what happened is that um, we're in this world of networks again. And so we had a, a, a large network of people that what I call the you know, resistance to kind of anti-Trumpers who have been working on you know, Russiagate and, and these, you know, they put Trump and, and, and Putin together as a kind of an existential enemy to the West. Um, kind of a rise of authoritarianism around the world. And, you know, for all these years, they've been working on this, uh, like creating, creating this vision of evil. And um, when Russia invaded Ukraine, it, you know, it triggered them. I mean, they Pro had all- Proved them right. Proved them right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they were, you know, all those, all those years of saying this, you know, five years of, of working on, 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 on casting, you know, Russia as the reason Trump was in office, uh, that he had he already pretty much declared war on the United States by intervening in U.S. elections in 2016. I mean, though, if you've actually looked at the stuff and, and the numbers involved, it's like, it's a, it's a not even a rounding error in the kind of propaganda we self-generate. And um, so they took it and they started turning this into an existential conflict, focusing on Russia, and they amplified every single message coming out of the Ukraine, and the Ukrainians were good at it themselves, but this network took it to another level entirely. Um, and um, the early successes of Ukraine in defending itself, you know, gave some plausibility that Russia could be defeated in this instance. And it kicked off a moral war that uh, has consumed the world, at least the Western world has pretty much jumped on. 
Um, that amplification put us into a, so that was a big change. That was a big difference between now and, and, and you know, years past and how we responded is this network formed and it, it took over the response to the war. Um, it uh, mobilized uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people you know, across the Western world to disconnect Russia. Uh, they had government ministers, you know, writing foreign policy out of their, you know, ministry, even though it has no, or agency, even though it has no connection to foreign policy, everyone was making their own foreign policy. Everyone was taking this kind of moral judgment. Uh, people inside of organizations were pushing for changes, uh, you know, coders working at different network, networking companies or, you know, service companies were, uh, you know, disconnecting Russia. <laughs> and Russia. How, how, how does it? How does it though? Like the way I, the easy way for me to think about to wrap my head around the network though is right. it, I think of it as Twitter. It's basically Twitter. It's a bunch of people churning ideas, and you can see them sort of multiplying and like becoming like a consensus, like this mach consensus machine where everyone's saying the same thing. But how is it that that Twitter, which is not real, how is it that that actually changes the foreign policy to the point of? of of basically every major power in the world to the point where they decide to steal Russia's bank reserves. Like, I don't understand right. how it makes that jump, you know? Right. Um, well, from what I can see is that, uh, you know, it, Twitter is very, very important to all of this. It's, it's kind of like a, you know, where news is kind of made the sausage factory for news in the modern environment. Um, it's where everything's hashed out and, and, and everything gets in the, into alignment. Um, is that uh, during the early phase, the amplification of the network, like saying, look, Putin is the ultimate evil. He's like invading, he's gonna be the you know, ultimate barbarian. It's autocracy versus uh, uh, democracy. Uh, we're in this battle, it's an existential battle. Boom, they hyped, hyped, hyped it. And it drove the Western news and, and most uh, people who are reading this stuff, seeing this torrent of information, um, it created a little bit of chaos. We moved out of complexity, uh, and into a, this little zone of chaos for this event. And uh, during that, during periods of chaos like that, where things are up in the air, assumptions are reset. Um, and you're looking for some way of, of actually framing the conflict that, or framing the event uh, that makes sense to you. And um, when we came out of chaos and society doesn't like to stay in that long, it tends to uh, solidify very quickly. Uh, all of the assumptions for this conflict were reset across the board from Biden in, in the White House to you know, somebody working in the customer service desk at an at a internet company. And so um, the assumption was that Russia was an existential threat, it, existential threat to all of us. It's uh, that whole framing that they, the network initially had became de facto, mm -hmm. um, became the kind of de facto framing and you know, de facto assumptions of everybody oper you know, operating with this. And so you had Biden constantly trying to you know, lead the swarm, lead this group, lead this network um, by coming up with new ways to escalate. So right. you know, calling Putin a war criminal and uh, then a, a butcher and then making, making it impossible to really negotiate with him. And um, then coming up with new ways to target him, going after his daughters or you know, finding new ways of disconnecting uh, you know, Russia and trying to cause regime change through economic and financial failure. Um, it's, um, yeah, it, those are assumptions once it's been reset and the whole thing has been framed in this way, it's, it, you know, there's no one, no one can actually backslide on it. Or if you try to do something different than those assumptions, everybody will pile on you. The whole yeah. swarm will focus on you. I figured that most leaders are in three camps. They either, throughout this whole, you know, ramp up is that either they um, have given over their decision making on this to the swarm and let it frame it completely. So they're just part of it. Um, or they are uh, rational thinkers where they've stepped back and go, what's going on? You know, I don't necessarily agree with this, but I can't say anything contrary to this because I will then become a target. I'll become mm -hmm. a Putin lover. I'll be ostracized. I'll be disconnected from, you know, my circles and everything else. And then the third group, um, probably the most dangerous is those who think that they actually can lead this thing. And the way these networks are led, these swarms are led, um, is that you have to uh, move it towards its goal. In this case, escalate the conflict more. And it's right. a temporary contingent leadership. It's not like a leadership because you are elected into it. It's like 
as long as you're moving that thing, you know, this swarm towards its goal, in this case, neutralization of Russia or, or disconnection and, and destruction of Russia, um, you'll be recognized as a leader. And those guys like Boris John, uh, Johnson early on was in that camp and then Biden has taken over and Blinken and that whole crowd are all trying to find ways to escalate this. Yeah, I mean, war crime trials, how we jump to that point, you know, uh, like the, earlier this week, I mean, all like it's just coming out. And I mean, that's just there's no chance for negotiation. And I, I just wonder, do these right. people who are trying to get in front of the swarm, you know, to show that they're or to be the leaders of it? I mean, do they not? Are they so irrational? that They do not understand the consequences of what they're doing now. At least on the U.S. side, you could see it's like tied into this lingering anger over Trump and the, and the kind of ungovernability of, of the U.S. political system now, um, and that Putin was attached to that. And you know, this is a way we have to eradicate this. We have to eradicate these authoritarians and this kind of threat to our decision making and the way things should work. And um, but. Uh, you know, I don't think the network as a whole has any uh, any conception of strategy or nuance. It's it's it it doesn't have any proportionality, meaning that it, you know, rather <laughs> it, it it goes all in. So like you know, when one person you know does something bad, the whole network will come down on them, and we've yeah. seen that in across the board in, in in you know in the U.S. over the last three four years, and we're seeing the same thing with this: is that they're maximizing. Uh, all their goals and 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 you know just trying to get to the biggest scale possible to kind of overwhelm the target, um, and they also uh, the network is has a sense of uh, invulnerability or it doesn't have a sense of mortality. It doesn't feel like it you know uh, like all organizations and individuals you can you know you, you can see your death or you know what will cause your destruction. Um, the network doesn't see it that way. They, they feel it so you know it feels like it's immortal because there's always yeah. somebody to replace you. And um, so nuclear weapons don't threaten it. It doesn't, it doesn't come in, doesn't factor into their calculus. The, it almost sort of, the, it feels like it's like the id of a 13 year old, you know, it, like it's like, it has no even sense of ego, even because it's not even concerned right. with its own destruction. And it's just so emotionally lashing out. And that's what it feels like to me. It's just, it's so, and it's dangerous because I think it's pushing us to the brink of nuclear war. Right. Uh, but to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of uh, divide the network. If I, I, I think I wrote about this a long time ago. Is like I have it. Uh, you know, the Freudian kind of framework is that this is kind of unconstrained superego. Oh, right. It's all moralism all the time. Uh, it's a, it's kind of a, a consensus-driven consensus in a loose sense. Uh, you know, assumed consensus-driven uh, uh, morality, kind of replacing a religion as as the basis. If we all agree on this, this is what it's going to be. Um, and that, uh, you know, in certain respects, that may actually be good if it's just a minimal set of agreements on how do we interconnect globally across all different, you know, cultures and, and viewpoints. But now there, when we go to a maximalist framework, it becomes oppressive. And um, then you have the establishment, which is more like the ego. You know, this is how we get things done, corporate and, and government and, and, and people who are actually focused on, on uh, operations. And then you have that kind of id, which is more on the right. It's like, wait a second, that pinches or that hurts. <laughs> Stop it. Okay. You know, yeah. you're, you're, it, it just, you lash out, you feel, it feels wrong. It's just like, don't. Yeah. And it's hard that to articulate. Sense. Right. And, yeah. um, it's more like a punch in the face when they respond. Right. It's like a disruptive, it's like, stop it. Uh, and, uh, mm. this, uh, unconstrained superego is a very dangerous thing. It's, a uh, I mean, I just don't see it because the network doesn't seem to be able to, if it, if it could settle on something that involved creating something, it'd be one thing, but it seems like it can only ever agree on destroying something, you know? Right. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Uh, if you do, if you engage in moral warfare uh, like this, is it, it's a uh, constraint. You know, a lot of the, uh, the movements in the, over the last four or five years on, uh, in the network space were about eliminating differentials in power and money and, 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 and gun ownership and things like this. I mean, so there's, so it puts everybody on a, on an equal basis and enforcing this constraint, uh, on behavior. Um, 
And it often is willing to go for maximal constraints just to protect a few people. So it'll change all of our, or seek to change all of our behaviors just to protect a few, and then do it through naming and shaming and, and, and aggressive action and influencing the big networks to disconnect people. So a lot of this game is uh, who has more influence over the, the corporate networks and the big services. Um, and uh, the swarm, if it can influence those networks like it is in this instance, uh, you can disconnect the enemy. So if you're disconnecting somebody who uh, on the right, it's, you know, you could, you know, eliminate their modernity by disconnecting them. They can't, mm -hmm. you know, use email, they can't go online, they can't, they can't get a job, can't use Monster or any of those other job services. You can't get a date, <laughs> you know, it's like you're off of everything, Tinder and, and all the dating apps. Uh, you're, you know, it's just basically you're not modern. <laughs> you're, yeah. you're living just with the people around you. So um, that, that makes a lot of sense, John. And of course, <clears throat> that has to do with the fact that all these big American corporations like McDonald's and KFC have closed that down, closed everything down in Russia, too. Right. Uh, so it, it really is kind of a, a kind of swarm war. But looking at the, uh, as you pointed out, uh, but uh, let's look at the military situation, because it seems to me that none of the people that are running the US government know anything at all about military matters. Kamala right. Harris, I mean, Joe Biden, uh, these people uh, like the Secretary of the Army and Defense, I mean, these are, these are all political hacks at best. So who's going to win the actual military confrontation between Russia and Ukraine? And how long will it go on? My best, my bet is that the Russians are going to win and win massively and quickly and then uh putin will withdraw uh just getting what he wants which is a neutral ukraine very reasonable request and an independent donbass a very reasonable request i mean but that's the way i see it how do you how do you see the military thing and how this is going to sort out well yeah the uh, afghanistan withdrawal is a pretty good indicator of the military competence of the the people involved I mean, that was just a disaster. That could have been a, a huge disaster with US troops and, and, and US civilians, or global civilians, all within striking range of, 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 of a force uh, surrounding Kabul or the Kabul airport. Yeah, that they were just, sitting in the airport. I was like, this is a death trap. If they want to kill them all, they can do it. Right, or, or shut down the airport and have them you know, go overland into Pakistan like, the, like they, the Brits did, sniping at them along the way. Uh, so there's really no military competence in the in the current U.S. government. I mean, even I, 2009, when I was at the Armed Services Committee, say you know, said let's get out of get let's get out of Afghanistan. There's no way to win this. We've, all our assumptions have, have been overturned. Um, but um, so who's winning this conflict? I think it's uh, the amount of weaponry that we're sending into Ukraine. Uh, mostly that every single soldier now in the Ukraine has a um, has a PGM precision guided munition over their shoulder, and uh, they have you know killer drones and that kind of killer drone tech. Uh, those switchblades and 600 series uh, are really effective. They're really force multipliers, and uh, it's becoming a death trap for Russian armor. So Russia obviously totally messed up its plan. Uh, it, overreached it didn't have the military competence to pull it off and then it also didn't appreciate you know all the pgms and, and training and the kind of expansive militia type strategy that uh ukraine had you know they took a switzerland kind of strategy or finnish strategy uh, in terms of how they built their military um after after crimea and um, russia was also didn't you say that russia was also kind of kid gloving it at first though like they didn't cut out communications they didn't right take down the like the us would have destroyed the electrical grid we would have destroyed the water systems blackouts you know and then before right. and then we would have rolled in yeah they thought they were going to get a quick you know mobile victory uh maneuver warfare seize uh uh Kiev, you know very very quickly and uh so they that didn't destroy the country in the process in, in the initial phases uh and they you know a lot of the information that we're seeing now that's driving this kind of swarm warfare was because they didn't take out those uh communi that communication grid right off the bat so uh, now they're withdrawing I mean, they withdrew from the the key front and they're concentrating their efforts on the east and and uh it's going to 
move more towards a defensive war for Russia. They'll take a couple areas, but um, it could be a long slog. I don't think the, the Ukrainians are um, a pushover at this point. Uh, it, it just given the kind of weaponry we have and, and given the kind of mobilization that they have, uh, you know, they have uh, say 400,000 troops now. Um, and Russia uh, is, you know, around a hundred and something at this point, um, it's going to be a grind. And um, the problem with the, the peace talks and it, there are two parts to it. It's the, the part that uh, between Russia and Ukraine, and you know, you know whether Ukraine will be um, neutral and what that neutrality looks like, whether they're part of the EU or part of NATO, or they get any kind of security guarantees. Um, and you know, then there's the territory. You know, is there an independent Donbass, or is there a Russian-controlled Donbass, or is there nothing at all? Um, so you know, that's all in contestant. Uh, that's being contested right now. But there's a second part is that when Russia goes to kind of get the, the West to ratify that treaty that uh, is that they're looking for the disconnection to end. Okay, so they're saying, okay, we, we've, we've cut a deal with the Ukraine, everything should go back to normal. And they go to the West and say, okay, let's end this war. Okay, let's open up the, the connections again, um, you know, lift all the sanctions, lift everything. And I don't think that's going to happen. I think when they go to do that, the, the effect of the assumption change and the swarm pressure, the residual swarm pressure uh, is going to be such that uh, you already see it in Miley and, and the statements in the background is that this is a multi-year fight. This is a long-term fight to try to collapse Russia. Um, and then they're not going to relax the sanctions at all. They're not going to relax the kind of disconnection at all. And Russia is going to be looking at that going, okay, so do I end this? Kind of get rid of the bleeding and, and, and the, on the conventional front, um, or do I escalate to de-escalate? De Meaning, that do I increase our my pressure on Ukraine by you know bombing it and destroying cities, maybe even escalating to tactical nukes to try to force an ending of this disconnection, create you know this try to get to the grand peace level where everybody comes to the table and we all negotiate together. Um, and so those, then, are the, those are the two options. They either they de-escalate and try and just pull out, essentially, right. or they, they try and escalate. Now, what's what's the trade-offs? For, like, is, is de-escalation on their part, is that even a reasonable possibility, do you think, at this point for them? Well, I mean, there's still... Okay, so if they de-escalate and they, they end the, the conventional uh, bleeding, you know, draw on their resources, uh, and the disconnection stays in, the, in effect, um, they're in a tough spot for a long time and they're risking, I mean, Putin's risking regime change. They're, uh, they're going to be uh, in a slow death spiral in terms of their economy. As much as they're trying to transition to China, it's not going to be fast. Their whole technology stack has been wiped out. You're not going to get that, you know, even uh, Taiwan Semiconductor disconnected them. So, you know, mm -hmm. not getting chip supplies. Um, and um, so, they have a kind of a timer on, on, you know, if they see, if they project out, they may actually see that their economy and, and their, their whole system will collapse in a year, maybe two years or three years. Um, so, or even short term, three months, six months. So what do they do to get out of that? Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I think they aren't fully cognizant of, of the, their situation, you know, the damage that they, they still, have the hope that you know if they can conclude this that they'll be connected again but i think they're slowly you know coming to the realization that this is not this is not going to end well when they start calling, going after putin personally saying you know put him on trial for war crimes um you know that he needs to go like that kind of thing it just seems like right. they're they're basically eliminating the possibility of uh you know a peaceful resolution or de-escalation Certainly, only if only if he get, get, regains the upper hand in some way does it seem like he might have better negotiation, doesn't it? Yeah, he, he has to he has to get make it so painful for the West that they have to come to the table. But you know, and, John, it, it it seems to me that other than Russia itself, the big loser in this is going to be the U.S. because right. people have lost confidence in uh, the dollar and the SWIFT system, 
and they don't trust the US at all. And how's China going to fit into this? It seems like they're going to come out ahead on this too. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a, that's a, the byproduct of this kind of swarm strategy is that it's focused exclusively on, on escalating this conflict with Russia based on those initial conditions that I talked about. And um, it has created a, 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 a big rift between the West and the rest of the world. So you have Russia, China, India. India is you know, still on the internal networks is, are still pro-Russia for the most part. Um, they don't want to switch because of 70 years of arms supply and, and, and support on, on Kashmir. Um, so they're not willing to actually give up Russia, even after all of this. Uh, and um, that is ultimately detrimental to the U.S. And there's talk now of Blinken's like threatening China with sanctions, trying to widen this and trying to disconnect China, which I think is going to fail because there's no internal kind of network support for the widening disconnection to China. Um, and that uh, by pushing Russia into China's arms, that uh, we're ultimately going to be the loser here. Um, and that nobody will trust putting, you know, anyone who may be on the wrong side of, of the Western network in the future will want to put money or services or anything in the hands of, of, of Western companies and, and, and Western, the Western system. Um, yeah, I think, it, I think it's ultimately going to be a bad, bad thing for us because of this, we let the network set the frame for this conflict. Um, so single-mindedly, it doesn't have any nuance. It doesn't, can't see the wider picture. And um, it's ultimately going to you know, work against this long-term. What do you think the odds of a, of a, a, a new tactical or otherwise being used in this conflict? I think it's a lot higher than, you know, I, I think it's more like... <laughs> this, that's not mine this time. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> If your dogs hear my dogs and your neighbor's dogs, dogs all over the world will start barking because of <laughs> the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think this was or is currently the most dangerous nuclear crisis since the Cuban Missile Crisis, from my perspective, uh, largely because we are not cognizant of the threat posed by nuclear weapons in this in this uh, conflict. Uh, we at least they're smart enough not to involve NATO troops directly in, 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 in Ukraine, um, trying to avoid the direct triggers. But um, we don't appreciate the fact that we've created, we've turned this conflict, which is a, you know, could have been just an expensive sub-regional war for Russia, uh, expensive learning lesson, uh, bloody their nose, retreat, figure out what to do later is that we turned it into an extent, existential war of survival. Now mm -hmm. Russia, you know, if, if it's not gonna be, dis, you know, it's gonna be uh, outside of the Western system and totally shunned and, and opposed uh, on every front, uh, it, it's um, now in a war of survival. And um, it may view uh, any weakness shown in, 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 in the war in Ukraine um, as a invitation to the West to start intervening and, and start to destabilize them within Russia. Um, and, uh, you know, for Putin, given already what they're doing through systems is that they start to contact people inside of Russia to, you know, start insurgencies, start, you know, uh, in motion uh, uh, coups and, and other things is that uh, he may need to or have the uh, desire to ward off the West and stop its encroachment. And, and Russians are, you know, are, are paranoid defensive from the get-go it's that was justifiably justifiably yeah. though right yeah i mean it's the there was a big insight from the uh the long telegram from kennan right is that he, he said you know communist russia is not an expansionary power it's ultimately russian and it's paranoid and it's defensive um it will react um and it knows that its system has always been weak and that but they're very prideful of that system regardless and they will defend it against any kind of encroachment uh with and you can see that in the kind of response russians have they don't they overlook any kind of bad stuff, but they'll hate the criticism. <laughs> they'll react like, you know, strongly against any kind of, you know, outside criticism um, coming from people who are clearly on the trying to wreck their country. So um, 
So the way to ward the West off, and this is probably the you know worst scenario I could think of, is that they use tactical nukes in, in Ukraine to show that they have that dealings and encroachment on Russia has serious consequences. And there will be some kind of lead up or some kind of you know misdirection that would um, cause that to be used. But it says basically, you can't come into Russia. Don't try to send anything into Russia. Um, don't encroach on us. And um, here's a totem to kind of ward, ward you off. A line in the sand, really. Just saying, we're redrawing the lines of, of how you can engage with each other. Right. Kind of resetting it and reminding the world that they are a nuclear power with 6,000 plus nukes. Hmm. Of course, I'd make the point that the West really is no longer the West anymore, because throughout the West, we have actual Bolsheviks that control the governments, certainly in Washington, D.C. I mean, these people are all really kind of crypto communists, frankly. They don't believe in Western values or Western civilization. Same in Canada, same in New Zealand, same in Australia. It's true everywhere. So the West is no longer the West anymore. And that really, to me, makes the, this whole stupid argument about autocracy versus democracy just nonsense. Yeah, it's this, uh, it's this self-derived set of values, this network-derived values that, they, that they're claiming as, as the replacement for traditional Western values, it, it, superseding it. And, uh, you know, where they can say, okay, you know, here's how we deal with each other and here's how we deal with the world. And we're making it up as we go based on collective agreement. Um, that is supposedly now the Western system. And it is that morality, you know, you know, function of the, of the network that, you know, that super ego that's, that's driving it. Um, it turns it, but it turns, it turns every, it turns it into a jihadi really, you know, of, of, of one form or another, right? It's just, it's pursuing some, some divine objective without any sense of reality or consequences at all. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's no foundation for this. You know, there's no, except for that we all somehow got to the point where we agree that this is a value, right? Mm. It's like, this is, this is what, this is a, uh, what is moral. And, mm. and, and um, yeah, definitely very similar to what you see in, you know, Puritan New England, you know, it's like, you know, and, it, and, and uh, you know, religious movements in the past. And, and I think it may go through the, actually the same kind of phases of growth and, and destruction, you know, where it's, you know, squeezes, it, it's become so oppressive. That's part of my long night problem is that you know, when I saw that, that the network was up for grabs and if this moral network, this uh, claiming, you know, waging moral warfare, sets the rules for the network and, and changes the way AIs are built into the infrastructure. Um, and you know, those rules are very restrictive and, and, and only allow a very narrow orthodoxy in terms of thinking on every topic. You know, anything that's not approved is, 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 is considered disinformation or misinformation and, and screened out by the AIs and, and by the system itself. Uh, we're in for stagnation and death as a system. Yeah, we're, we're, we're in a virtual Salem at that point. Right. Right. Well, those are interesting points, partially, I think, because <clears throat> just as you remarked earlier on uh, religion and the absence of religion as a moral influence in the West, at least I think that's what you're saying. Remember, it wasn't so long ago that uh, uh, the followers of Muhammad, Islam was the great danger to the West and the big, the big thing was on everybody's lips and the 911 and all this type of thing. We haven't heard anything about that for uh, for years. So I wonder if there's going to be a, a resurgence uh, since there's no religion in the West. I wonder if the West is going to wind up adopting uh, Islam as a religion because people kind of need a religion, it seems. And uh, I wonder if Islam is going to have a resurgence as a result of all this. Hmm. I, I, I do think it's... Uh... This Western network, this this moral warfare that they're waging is it tries to see everything else as it's like the Borg in, in Star Trek, right? It's like it sees all other moral movements as something they can grab a hold and 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 you know change. You know, one of the big kickers why this is going so fast is that the mainstream Protestant church pretty much dissolved in the yeah. last 20 years. It went to zero. It's like, you know, it 
people were, you know, who grew up in that church were like, wait a second, all of the public morality that, you know, is being pushed right now is pretty much the same as you get in the church. And so why go to church? Right? So it, 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 it um, so the, you know, they're trying to kind of become the superset of what is moral and how we live our lives and uh, how we interact with each other. And um, you can fit any religion in there as long as it fits the, fits in that framework, you know, lives within that constraint. I think, uh, you know, people are ultimately unhappy with this. I mean, you know, it, 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 the level of misery that, that comes out of the way things are run right now uh, is pretty darn high. I mean, you know, the way family structure and, and way you see yourself has been completely destroyed and undermined. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, you know, trying to fit it into this new thing that's being made up on the fly is, uh, is, is not only jarring, it's destabilizing, it, it nihilistic and for many people. Right. And it's, and it's only really possible though, because of the vacuum that's there, you think, um, and because of the tool set that exists now, but the, the, and it seems like it's all consuming. And sometimes when it gets moving, it doesn't feel like it can be stopped, but it has been stopped in a couple of the occasions. Right. Like for instance, you saw that, that drum beat for no fly zone. I mean, that was serious where you had this one press conference where you had all these 20 something, uh, you know, female journalists basically all asking the hardest questions I've ever asked, I heard them ask the Biden administration about why they don't escalate to a no fly zone. And it felt like, you know, I mean, everybody was almost demanding it. And I'm like, these people are demanding nuclear demise. I mean, they right. have no idea what right. they're doing. And so cooler heads prevailed at that point. Like, and, I, and how, why was that different than, why did it work then? And it doesn't work most of the time. Right, well, that one deployment came down to the decision of a couple people, right? So, it, you know, when that, isn't the case, you'll see it just go because people work around it and make it happen. I see. It almost worked around it when, when uh, Poland tried to send jets in. And uh, so when there's individual decisions that uh, can serve as a you know, stop on the swarm, it, you know, we sometimes get good results. You know, sometimes you know, it, reason kind of emerges um, and wins out, but it's a, uh, I mean, it isn't always the case. There, I mean, there's other ways to kind of control the swarm. Is like, for instance, uh, you know, I suggest in the most most recent report is that we uh, use a kind of a circuit breaker mechanism for, uh, like we do with markets. When markets start getting really chaotic, um, and you know, it's a you know, whatever, it's a low information environment, and people are like going going nuts. Uh, is that uh, you, you halt trading for a while? In this case, you halt Twitter, take it offline mm -hmm. for a week. You know, or, you know, just <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it would allow everyone to kind of a more rational process to kind of emerge. And, and then the policy wouldn't be set, would be kind of set and people would have thought it through. And um, before being driven into this panic mode, into this chaos uh, where assumptions can be reset. Of course, so, you talk about a, a low information environment. That's exactly what we're living in in the West because there's absolutely no reporting whatsoever of things from the Russian point of view or from anything other than the uh, standard mainstream media who all talk in lockstep. So right. we, have, we have a completely distorted view of what's actually happening on the ground uh, now. Yeah, hundred percent. The swarm blocked with, with the help of the big networks blocked all information coming out of Russia. Um, any kind of reporting on, on uh, say even from, you know, Russian hits on Ukrainian forces and, and damage to Ukrainian forces, uh, all that was blocked. Um, and any information on, on the status or, 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 or the, the effectiveness of Russian attacks on, on Ukraine uh, was blocked off the networks. And, and uh, any kind of alternative views regarding this war were all blocked um, or shadowed down um, or disconnected in one way or another. So we, we were in this kind of, you know, tribal echo, echo chamber where we're not allowed to even think outside of the box. Well, it's just like the COVID stuff was really in, in, in many ways. Right. And I just, I wonder if the, if the powers that be really see that they are actually doing a circuit breaker of sorts by cutting off those people. You know what I mean? Like well, I, they're intervening to block bad actors is the way they well, look at it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, 
but you know, I see this kind of network decision making system as as two parts. Is one thing is like coming to agreement to mobilize relatively quickly. Um, a lot of different viewpoints coming together to solve one problem, which is good. But you also need a d dissent function where it's like people go slow. They slow down that kind of agreement and that mobilization, or they you know when that those assumptions that led to that decay, the dissent will pick them apart, right? And like, you know, we saw with, with COVID, you know, it's like the dissent was attacking it from all these different directions. So if you, if you weaken the dissent function and eliminate it, you get this like, you know, this jihad, right? Just like this, yeah, like, exactly. this uh, everybody has to think the same way. And, um, you know, we have to have the kind of protections for that dissent. And, the, and I've been pushing, I did it in Senate last, last fall, you know, pushing this digital rights idea, digital data ownership and that kind of thing to kind of make sure that they can't disconnect the dissent. Yeah. And, you know, I have a pretty high, we have very low tolerance for even the, you know, a, a small amount of, of, of disagreement now, uh, you know, we'll see somebody saying something and they go, you're misleading people. And everyone will like immediately cut them off, even though they're just a small voice in, in this torrent of information. Um, no, you, we, you mean they're you mean they're a mouthpiece for Putin is what you're saying, right? Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> you can't see, but we need that kind of dissent to stop us from. Uh, yeah. You know, just. Well, and it's interesting the way, the way the Russians are being painted as the orcs. Actually, yeah. are, it seems like the only thing that they bomb, they like they particularly zero in on maternity wards, hospitals, schools, churches. And, you know, and, and people actually believe this, which is actually the exact opposite of what I think the Russians are trying to do. Just take out military targets and not destroy uh, civilian um, uh, centers. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the whole thing is just disgusting. Yeah, I, I, I do think, though, that there is a lot of um, uh, you know, heavy duty hatred in the Russian forces for Ukrainians at this point. I mean, they got, they got, uh, they got mauled, uh, on, you know, during the initial phases of this invasion and, and, uh, uh, that kind of bloodbath loss of life incineration, you know, is, is going to make them in a, in a, in a relatively poorly led army make, the, uh, atrocities almost inevitable. I mean, those guys are going to just take things out on, on, so, uh, also, there's a kind of a, a, a thing that the Russians could do, you know, is trying to, you know, in terms of increasing the coverage, I mean, moving from Buka discussion and try to, okay, let's, let's hit the railway, the, the, the station today, um, you know, with a, with a missile in order to kind of get that discussion off of, hmm. off of Buka. So it's a lower grade kind of atrocity, but it kind of misdirects people or gets people off that earlier topic. So we're not talking about that anymore. And that moves it, you know, Russian strategy with this would be to, to be less effective in the West, but more effective everywhere else is just uh, disrupt, 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 change the topic very, very quickly with these news disruptions uh, and uh, um, make it harder for people to make um, decisions uh, that would be uh, contrary to uh, their interests or make it decisions at all, or get totally fatigued and overwhelmed to the point where they just say, I don't even want to hear about that anymore. You know, yeah. I've had enough of this stuff. It's, you know, it's wearing me out. So what do you think, how do you think this, what would you, how would you, uh, we talked about the de-escalation part and then you start, you were also explaining what you thought about the escalation options. I'm just curious what you think, what, what your guess would be, how things turn out, um, you know, in this scenario, how much, how much, how much longer does this dispute last? Does this war last there? And, um, you know, how does it ultimately end? Yeah, it's, it, I always found it hard to predict when it's, you know, down to the decision of a couple people, mm. you know, was, uh, what goes through Putin's mind is really, you know, he has very few checks and balances on his, his, his ability to act. Um, it's pretty clear that the oligarch pressure wouldn't work because Russian oligarchs aren't like tycoons in the West. They're a lot more, they get their legitimacy for their money through Putin. So eliminating him would eliminate any kind of legitimacy he had, they become the targets of the next, anyone coming in next. Um, but if his decision-making process is um, driving a lot of this, it's hard to figure out exactly where it's gonna end up. Larger trends is that, you know, we're locked into this kind of 
existential conflict. And um, what will happen is that the, there are a lot of nonlinearities in this conflict and we're gonna get burned. There are gonna be things coming out of left field and, and new global crises, like all the supply disruptions and things that as those percolate through, we haven't even recovered from the supply disruptions from the previous uh, couple of events. And um, prices are still out of whack and, and supplies are still not arriving when they should. And the just in time economy is, you know, is, 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 is grinding gears on a constant basis. So um, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of nonlinearities, a, a lot of them having to do with China and how it acts. Uh, a lot of them having to do with uh, India. It looks like there is a kind of Asian axis of sorts. Some people call it dragon bear and other ways of looking at it. It's like, it goes from China, Russia, India, India playing kind of a, a leaning kind of role, uh, Saudi Arabia and others who are all of one mind to kind of resist the kind of West pressure. And the West moralization, you know, why, you know, kind of a competing system of sorts and uh, they don't want to encroachment. They see a lot of what's going on in the West in terms of it's this new consensus driven morality as a threat to them. Um, you know, if you're focused on family structure in China, you don't want this thing in, you know, it's, it's corrosive asset to that kind of family structure that they really, you know, focus on so much there. Yep. Hmm. But Doug's basic premise that he thought that ultimately what would happen is that, uh, you know, Russia's just trying to really take this breakaway area, uh, establish a Ukraine, uh, neutral Ukraine. Yep. Is that is that in the cards in your mind uh, in the near future in any way? Is there is there a way they can escalate to this or de-escalate to that point? I think the first part of the treaty uh, is is more than possible. Um, it's that second part that in a, Russia's negotiation with the West, that's where the fireworks will happen. And uh, and how that influences the first, you know, that first treaty uh, is uh, up in the air. Um, I do know that that I, I, I do believe, based on what I see, is that the pressure to uh, keep this conflict going with Russia over the long term to the point where they actually uh, have regime change and potentially even uh, nuclear disarmament is, is going to stay in place. That is not unless going to unless there's unless there's something else that the network focuses on. Right. If there's yeah. something new, well, if it, if we try to expand it, or there's something new, like in, with you know, if China takes on Taiwan, um, there will be an attempt to expand it. But I don't think there's like the basis for um, treating China as an enemy uh, in the in the West as as there was with Russia. Right. I mean, China has been so great at I mean manipulating Western um, media and um, entertainment. I mean, they have you know, veto power over every script coming out of Hollywood that affects every single show across the board on, on all the streaming services and everything that never on any of those could, could China be depicted as an enemy, as a bad guy. And, right. um, and that kind of thing that, you know, Russia's always the bad guy or the CIA. So it's like in every single uh, thriller, right? And, um, right. you know, it's like Russian mafia or Russians or, 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 so there's kind of an underlying kind of framing of this. Well, and if nothing else, there was that shortcut with Trump and equaling Putin, them being the same and that right. transference yeah, of all that negative bag, baggage to him. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that, uh, yeah, that the, uh, this whole China thing is going to blow up on us. You know, mm -hmm. if it tries to refocus on that and then it fails, then potentially the whole effort to kind of focus on Russia or disconnect it fails and uh, everyone becomes disillusioned with it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, We'll see. It, there's so many nonlinearities coming out of this. It's just like it, it's, it's going to be chaotic. That's the prediction. It's going to be chaotic. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're in what I call a permacrisis. It's this one event after the next comes off this complex global system, and we don't have the decision-making system necessary to handle it. And the new one that's coming in is actually making worse. We haven't had you know, 500 years to get our arms around it, like we did with bureaucracy and, yeah, and markets. We really right? haven't, and we really haven't talked about the elephant in the room, which is the collapse of the Western financial world and economic system, which is also in the wings, which is really going to complicate things much further. Well, and it seems like Russia accelerates it, right? With their with with all of this pushing them out of the financial system, it seems like that just moves it much step one step closer. Yeah. So when the when the tide goes out, all those rotten assumptions become visible. 
<laughs> it's like we've we've built this system on assumption piled upon assumption upon assumption and a lot of that core infrastructure that foundation is is rotten now and we can't revisit it it's like the afghanistan war it's like you know we're in afghanistan um but no one really can remember why we're there it's just we continue to operate on the assumption that we should be there but you, you know no one's challenging those 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 assumptions for spending that two trillion dollars and uh it's like the same thing here. It's on a grand scale. It's like you know, we can't even talk about the, the core problems in the system to even fix them. And That's right. when once things you go set up, a, Once you set up an infrastructure to do something in government, it doesn't go away. Like TSA was set up for a temporary crisis, but it's never going away. Same right. thing. Right. And the, you know, each one of these uh, crisis events coming off this global system are, is, is un unearthing or, or revealing more of this rotten infrastructure hmm. and at some point it just goes boom and wow. it, in order to kind of control things that the, the network control that long night is going to be crucial it's like how do you handle everybody well you set up a system i mean it, the wild part about it is we corporations have done in the last 20 years what totalitarian nation states have tried to do for ever is that they've built on the cheap uh, surveillance and control system that uh, can you know scale to billions of people. And they got us, they got they us. we financed it, John. Oh, right. We financed it out of choice. I mean, we, we, they didn't right. have to tax us and take it away from us. We, we bought our jail cells. Yeah, and it, 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 you know, it's going to be, it's already able to watch every conversation by done by billions of people in real time and, and change and modify and direct them. It, you know, once we add augmented reality and stuff, everyone's going to be wearing glasses in the next five, 10 years. And, you know, you start putting digital objects and digital sensory experiences into your daily life. It's going to be in our perceptual stream too. And it's all going to be mitigated and moderated by these AIs. And I don't think AI not being the kind of human equivalent AI. I mean, I mean the kind of symbiotic AI that lives on the data in between us, in between our interactions. Um, like the big ones being built in Facebook and, and Google and Apple. Right, this is, it's very simplistic AI, much like the network is very simplistic, right? It just can only move things step, step by step in a particular direction, right? Right, well, it, it's, it's like the deep learning AIs are typically a, you set out a goal for it and it finds a way to get to that goal, but it can take in, it, it, what it, the path it takes is not predetermined and the, the end result is a black box. You don't know why it made the decision it made. It's like teaching a kid how to play catch, right? So you play catch with a kid and the neural network builds on how to, you know, at, in the kid's head, you know, for catching it, but there's no physics involved. There's no, nothing, <laughs> they just figure out how to do it, right? Yeah. And that's the same thing with these AIs. Is they just kind of figured out how to achieve the result based on the data that they had. Okay, so last, well, that's been quite, we've been going a little long, so I just have a couple more questions for you, actually. Sure. And Doug, please ask anything if you have it. But wasn't there something that some sort of, uh, you know, uh, information management or coercion propaganda like tech system that was built and deployed in the Middle East, that then somebody, that people who left the Trump administration were supposedly maybe deploying here during the last election? I, I, I can't remember if it was, um, uh, I can't remember which general it was who was who had that, but but you know you might maybe it was Kelly actually, but um, I wonder how much of what we're seeing with the network now is that algorithm deployed that is moving us in a specific direction. Maybe maybe it isn't all swarm. Maybe it is. Maybe we are being pushed in a particular yeah. direction. You know, from what I've seen, and I've been up to my eyeballs on a lot of the military efforts and the, and the government efforts on on information warfare. Not even up. It's not even close to the up to the task okay. to even pull good off to anything. Know. It's good yeah. to know. I mean, I mean, 2020. It was always kind of funny to see the kind of Trump and all these other folks focus on election returns at the, you know, proclaiming it was manipulated. But you know, that's neither here nor there. The, the reality was is that the networks controlled the information flow and and changed the outcome in 2020. Mm. So it, what you saw from Trump who had to have that kind of direct intervention uh, or direct contact uh, was, was heavily censored and mood, muted and, and deamplified. And um, you know, the outcome was largely determined by that. Yeah. So there was intervention at a, at a grand scale and it was everywhere. I mean, everyone was, was you know, being you know, 
to a certain extent, it controlled and the outcome was achieved. What we've seen in the US is that they, these big corporate networks uh, have taken control of the stabilization of the United States. Uh, willingly, the government has kind of given them that authority and they are controlling the debate on the larger social issues, um, determining what is valid to talk about and what's not, uh, controlling election outcomes, uh, you know, and then also, also determining who can be a candidate. Because I mean, Trump was a viable candidate till uh, January. And when he was disconnected, he became instantly non-viable in the general election. Yeah. So, um, you know, disconnecting the most powerful person in the world shows that they were above everything. And, um, you know, they don't have any rules. I mean, there's a classic thing where they say the constitution has been superseded by terms of service. So TOS, terms of service are now much more important to our future speech rights and everything else uh, than any, any constitutional protections. And corporations can control whether or not we are modern or not, or you know, mm. in any way viable on, on a global scale or even a personal scale. Um, so you know, we need those rights to kind of protect us against corporate overreach and, and control and this network of influencing these corporations. The swarm, you know, saying, "Okay, here's here's what we want you to do," um, and having them take action against us. So, I, yeah, it, all this state level manipulation is is small compared to the stuff that we're doing to ourselves. Yeah. You know, it's like while I was watching the Russian stuff, I was like interviewed on um, the Donald, which is the Reddit group in favor of Trump, uh, just because of my warfare stuff. They wanted to figure it out. You know, one week after uh, Trump was interviewed. He did an AMA and I did an AMA about a week mm. later, which is kind of cool, but yeah. I didn't have nearly the kind of flow that he did afterwards. <laughs> but the thing is, it was, it was cool to see the same thing in the summer of, of 2016 and, and uh, the volume of information that was, you know, the kind of disruptive techniques and, and meme production and everything else on that site from, you know, with three, 400,000 people dwarfed in any given day, dwarfed everything the Russians did in any kind of state level effort. Uh, 10 to 1, 101 uh, over the course of the entire election season. So, yeah. you know, it's just like watching this self produced, network produced um, insurgency and in operation um, shows that, you know, this is out of control. It's a, you know, fast, loose, and out of control kind of thing. It's a, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, you know, we're being, uh, we're driven forward and we don't really quite know where it's going. I'm trying to figure out the rules for how it works, but kind of get ahead of it, but which, been pretty predictive on the whole um, no you've been very predictive on the whole and I actually like as I, I was telling Doug and I were talking about you coming on here and I said you are we're talking about uh, Doug so's well John is a very and he hated using this expression he said out of the box thinker this is that's the expression sucks but uh but it's 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 the most accurate way I think to describe you except for maybe the most unconventional thinker uh, I've ever known and there's at least three times and I've since I've known you over the last 12 years that you've told me, you've given me a, a piece of information or like a context for something that then changed the whole way I thought about something vastly larger. And that's the kind of stuff you do. And I, and I, I, I love that you're out there doing it. And I strongly encourage everybody to go to your Substack and subscribe, um, you know, follow you on Twitter. It's johnrob.substack.com. Uh, they can find you there. You have a new paid newsletter. Encourage people to subscribe to it. They'll love it. So thanks, Great. John. I really appreciate you joining us today. Is there anything thanks, else you wanted to add before we go? Doug, was there anything else you want to add before we go? No, I, it, it, other than to say my, my heart goes out to you, John, because I'm afraid that you have to associate with these constipated beltway, inside the beltway type thinkers all the time uh, in, in what you usually do. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I appreciate your pain. Uh, thanks. Uh, for the most part, though, when they do war games and things like that, they pull me in as a kind of a red teamer because I tend to break all the other stuff. It's like, yeah. I come up with the innovative ways to make them, make them worry and get, get but they don't pay it, but they, but, but they won't pay any attention to it. So don't worry about that. That's true. Uh, some yeah, do, let, but well, you're, not enough. Well, if, if you're not a really, uh, really big line item, budget item, I don't, they probably don't even know what to do with you. Right. You know? If it doesn't so, involve like you're creating another F-22 or something like that. Yeah, I, you know, it does, it does have influence. I mean, I, I think, uh, I've been told a couple of places, and I've mentioned this before, it's like it, Brave New War got up to the JCS, chairman of JCS level. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, my op-ed in the Times in, in, in 2005 
about how to end the war in Iraq had an influence and it pretty much kind of played out like that. So, yeah. you know, in, using the Shia as a, as a, as a kind of a, the hammer against our, our, our anvil. And um, so it, it does have an indirect influence. I, I, I don't know if I'm kind of like the guy behind the guy and a lot of the stuff I have to, I'm way out of the picture. So I come up with this stuff and other people run with it and market it and make it bigger, but, um, or it gets translated to somebody else's book at some point. So it's like, I don't mind. It's okay. I have no problem with it. Yeah, but you, but you really do influence the way a lot of ideas form and you have been incredibly, um, well, thank you predictive of where we end up today. And it's, uh, I'm always impressed by, I, I love following all your stuff. I appreciate to having you as a friend because you make me think better. And I appreciate you being here today. Well, thank you, Matt. Th thank you, Doug, for the time. Thanks, John. And yep, always a pleasure. Okay. Okay.